Okay, guys. Um, so, on the whole, I think most of you did pretty well on quiz two. Um, I haven't actually calculated the average mark, but there were a lot more above fours than there were on the first one, so that's good. Um, I think the major source of loss of marks would be there was probably five, six, maybe seven people that didn't actually specify any bearings. Um, so obviously a shaft uh, needs bearings. Um, so that would be you know, a, a major source because gears can't stop moving space and all that kind of stuff. So just think about the actual machine component. So I realise it's a test and you guys are writing numbers down and things. But every single example, every single quiz, every single exam that you get for this class will be a real thing. And if it doesn't make sense and if it wouldn't actually operate in reality, then you're not analysing it right or you're not interpreting it right. And if it's confusing, feel free to ask me a question. The worst I can do is say, sorry, I can't answer that. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, even in my telling you that I can't answer something, I'll give you a hint uh, and it will give away some of that uh, problem. So, um, please, shafts have bearings unless they're carried by... Um, the one exception, I think, is uh, like CB shafts, half shafts or whatever, that are actually carried by their, their attachment when they move in space. So if a shaft actually stays in space, it is bearings. Um, workshop, I think the workshop was pretty much fine. Uh, pretty, pretty similar to previous years. So uh, please use whatever feedback Nick's given you um, to try and improve for the next one. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's that. Um, so what we're going to do today, and forgive my voice guys, I've got the cough that everyone's got, so if I break down and have a massive coughing attack halfway through, um, we'll just have to endure. Um, we're going to do bolts today, obviously, we're going to do bolts tomorrow, and then we're going to be done with bolts, aside from maybe a tutorial on Monday on them. Um, you guys should be starting to get comfortable with the idea of analysing force on bolts if they don't have pretension. What we're going to talk about today is how we analyse for pretension. Um, up to now, bolts have been fairly easy, I'd say, pretty equivalent to sort of the complexity of looking at a shaft or welder or anything like that. This part is the part that takes a little bit to actually interpret the, the, the actual pretension part. Um, is a little extra step on that process that you just have to think carefully about um, and then when we do the fatigue we have to incorporate this into the fatigue as well so tomorrow we'll finish on what I talked about today. Before we do that let's start to uh, get some terminology and uh, lay this out what you do know um, so that when I teach you something new in a minute um, it sort of matches with that. So this slide here is showing you effectively what you know already, right? So this is showing you that we have analysed load on a bolt, FB, so it's the force in the bolt, and you can calculate, you know, if it's just an axial load, you can have to calculate the axial stress by that divided by its area. And we've calculated that based on what an external load on that bolt is, all right? And so in this case, this is how I would draw a section through what would be sort of a flange and maybe an end plate, right? So this bolt goes around in a big circle like that, right? So bolt, 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 bolt. Nice big round end plate, cap, seal, whatever, and some sort of a pipe with a flange coming out, right? And so if you have an internal pressure in that vessel, then that pressure is going to act on the lid, it's going to push it up, it's also going to act on the side, but the bolt doesn't do anything about those sides. Those sides are held there because the hoop, you know, hoop loads around the actual item itself. So the only load that the bolt sees is the pressure pushing up on that lid there. Okay? And so if you've got six bolts, you calculate what the force from the total pressure is, and you divide it by six, and that's our you know, applied force to that bolt. Now, over here, I've got a force Verse FE, FE being externally applied force. Okay, so this is arbitrary because what I'm saying here is this line is the force in the bolt and this line is the force in the plates. And we haven't got any pretension, so we're not pinching down those plates at all if we're not squashing them, there's no compression there. So the force in the plates stays at zero, nice and horizontal. 
the force in the bolt goes up at a 45 degree and is you know, linear with the externally applied load divided by the number of bolts. Obviously, so that's the load per bolt. Alright, so that's very easy, nice linear curve. We haven't really needed need to think much about that. And just so that you guys are completely familiar with the idea of one of these, these types of components, let's do a quick little example. So, let's say that this, this is the side view of a section through that bolt, and I'll draw the top of that. So that's the top. This is the internal area where the force, uh, where the pressure applies. And let's say that we have six bolts that are evenly spaced, equidistant from one another. The internal diameter is 0.1 meters. And the pressure is 100 APA. What's the force on a bolt? You guys should be able to do that. Calculate for me FB. What is FB? Assuming that, and what we can even say is assuming, that FC, which is the force in the plates, equals zero. So that's just this line here. So all you need to do is calculate what the total force on this area is divided by the number of bolts and use this equation which is FB equals FE you've got the force of the bolts. So do that in a couple of minutes. <coughs> if you don't know the relationship between pressure and force, think about the relationship between stress and force. It's exactly the same. Alright, here we go. numbers. So, Fe total equals area times the pressure, which is just pressure equals force on area rearranged here. So, Fe equals pi times 0 0.1 squared on 4 times 100E3. And I get that as 785.4 newtons. Does everyone got that? Yep. Um, and then what's my force per bolt? 130.9, that's right. It's just that divided by, um, by 6. So what we could say is Fe uh, per bolt, maybe. Equals 785.4 on N. We normally use N for the number of bolts. Equals 130.9. Newtons and F. Sorry, but we can't see that here. Let's do it up here. I apologise for the being all over the shop, but um, FB equals FE per bolt equals 130.9 newtons. Okay? So, that's the really easy case, what we've done so far, but that's sort of putting it in the type of terminology and the sort of the, the framework that we'll be using for these pretension cases. Um, and the reason for that is that if you think about this particular circumstance, this is a pressure vessel, and we've got 100 kPa here, we need to hold some sort of a seal in this gap there. So that flange and the flange plate need to actually seal on one, one another. And you're not going to get that to seal just based on hopes and wishes. Um, what you're probably going to have to do is get a lot of pretension in those bolts so that those plates pinch together. And for actual seal applications, you'll probably use a gasket. And a gasket is a bit of material you put in that gap that's softer than the material that you're clamping it with. So if you've got steel, a good gasket might be copper. Um, in some circumstances it might be rubber, in some circumstances it might be cork. Um, any sort of soft metals are the most common ones for proper mechanical engineering applications. 
Um, and so the pre-tension bolt actually squashes either the plates or that gasket down and then that forms a seal such that you can actually maintain that pressure on the inside there. Alright, so we need pre-tension for that and we need pre-tension for all the other things that I talked about which is the friction between the plates in a, you know, a bending or a torsion or a shear application and lots of other advantages as well. Um, so if you have pre-tension oftentimes the, the nut is much less likely to come off um, you might have a split washer or a crush washer or various things that you put under that and so the tension actually squashes that and then the, the compression you put in that actually holds the nut there and stops that coming off. So there's lots of applications where you're using pre-tension on bolts. Alright, and so for that case, alright, we still have our externally applied load. We calculated exactly the same as what we did. So Fe, you now know how to calculate Fe per bolt. Done. Right? We still have a load in the bolt, but that bolt, that tensile load in the bolt, is going to be some combination of the pretension. So we've already stretched it, and then we've added this load, and that's stretched it a bit more. Okay, so we have pretension plus whatever external we've added to it. And then we have compression in the plates or clamping forces on the plates. So that's our new one, FC. And that's important too. Because when FC equals zero, our seal is now garbage. So as soon as you don't have any clamping force in those plates anymore, you've now lost seal and that's it. And so that's what we use for design criteria around gasket failure. Okay, so we need to know that as well. Uh, and the sum of all of these forces is equal, all right? So this plus this plus this has to all uh, be in equilibrium. Um, if you don't have any external force, you can see that the amount of tension in the bolt is just equivalent to the amount of compression in the plate, right? So Fe, Fc, and Fb. Is everyone comfortable with what those three things represent? Good. Because what we actually have is what's called the bolt diagram and we will have some bolt equations uh, that give us each of those values for a particular external load. Now I've drawn just this sketch so that we can actually move, so this is our same diagram here, force against external force. So we'll have a line, this one here is for the bolt and this one here is for the plate. Uh, all the clamping force in the, in the plate. Let's imagine that our external load is zero. So we haven't applied any external load. Remember what I just said? Fb is equal to Fc. Because that's the only thing that we can balance out. And so those two values are here. And that's Fi. So our initial force that we put on the bolt is equivalent to the initial clamping force. Now you'll see both of these are in the positive direction theoretically, one's compression and one's tension. It's just easier to draw it on the diagram like this because it trades off quite nicely. Alright, so one's, technically that's as drawn. So as drawn as FC is down, FB is out in tension. Okay. Um, so at that point where you have no external load whatsoever, both lines hit FI, which is, you know, you can calculate that based on your area of your bolt, your proof load, 90% or 80% Now, let's add some Fe, let's add some external load, all right? And think about what actually happens to that bolt when you add the external load. Add some external load here, so that's already in tension, so that's going to stretch more, so those plates are going to pull further on that bolt. Um, and so F for the bolt, this line here, travels up, and now the plates, and what we do is we actually, there will be sort of localised compression there just from loading up of the, the bolt there, but we ignore that, we talk about the, the total net pressure, or really what we're interested in is the compression at this surface here. The compression at that surface is the compression that we're interested in for the gasket, so that's really where it is. And so any of those localised head effects that are compressing that plate or bending it down a little bit as you load it up, don't count there. Alright, so as you've added a bit of external load, these plates have separated a bit, and as they separate, the compression in the plates gets less. Yeah? And so that's what's happening here. 
we're stretching the bolt, the bolt's getting longer, and as the bolt gets longer, the plates have less compression in them. They're still touching, and there's still some compression, it's just decreasing. So the plate compression starts going down. And so there's a trade-off between bolt tension going up and plate compression going down. Now, you get to this point. This point, effectively, the external load that you're applying here has stretched the bolt to the point where these plates are their initial height. So there's no compression left in those plates. You've stretched it enough right at that threshold of they're still touching, but there's no load in them. And at that point, here, line comes down here, your compression in the plates got to zero, and this one's come up to here, and you're whatever point that is, and you've got zero compression and tension in the bolt. And at that point, if you've got zero compression in the plates, all of that external load is carried by the bolt. So that point there is actually FB equals FE. Because all of that external load is carried in the bolt, because the other one's zero. And it's just a sum of all three, right? And then we go further, and further, you've now got plate separation. And there's a gap between those plates. And from then on, the plates play no further part in that calculation and any external load is equal to the bolt load. So all of the external load is carried by the bolt. And so we go back to this line here at the 45 degree where FB equals FE, which is our previous one. Yeah, so exactly the same. So what we've done is we've started here and we've come up like this but we've just met up with this line and then we continue on once you separate the plates. Because once you separate the plates, they play no part and it's exactly the same circumstance as before. So if you're to the right of plate separation, then you just treat it like FB equals FE. If you're to the left of that separation, then you need to work out what these actual values are and how they trade off. Uh, and if I asked you for to prove that a gasket isn't failing, you need to work out where this point is because that's the, the critical point. Um, and a factor of safety two is sort of half the load back from that. A factor of safety three is two thirds back and so forth. All right, does that make sense? A little bit of sense? Vague amount of sense? Yeah, we'll do more on it. So this is all in your textbook, obviously. And so what we need to do is actually calculate or find equations that give us the points so that we can characterize this graph. Because as soon as we have all three points on that graph, um, and potentially equations to these lines. If you have a particular external load, you can work out what your bolt load is. If you know what your bolt load is, that's how you calculate your bolt stress, and so forth. Yep. Um, and so, it actually depends on the uh, stiffness of the bolt uh, and the stiffness of the clamped area of the plate or the gasket, depending on what you're talking about. Okay. And we calculate that stiffness using these equations. Now, these are from your textbook. Um, I could have rewritten them, but it was easier just to do this. AB, area of the bolt. Everyone know where to find that? Yeah, it's in the table. You've got it. EB, Young's modulus. What's the Young's modulus of steel? Two hundred GPA. 200 gigapascals? Yeah, about 207 gigapascals. Now, gigapascal by 10 to the 9. Every single year, people will put it by 10 to the 6 on that over and over and over and over again. Um, it is by 10 to the 9, it is gigapascal. Please put a note in your pad to make sure when you're using gigapascals that you use 10 to the 9s. Um, there is a table in your textbook uh, in one of the appendices that gives you Young's modulus for a variety of metallic materials. So steel is 107 gig, stainless steel is about 190 gig, uh, copper I think is 121 gig, um, and there's brass and various others as well. So there's a table in your textbook, uh, and I will provide that on the exam. If you look at previous exam papers, that table is provided. Okay, so. Don't just try and memorise it. Uh, that table will be provided. Please get comfortable using the table. So, we've got a steel bolt, say 207 gigapascals, so that's 207 by 10 to the 9. Area of the bolt, 
Remember, if we're working in, if we do 10 to the 9, we're working in pascals, so we must be working in meters, newtons, pascals, etc. So your bolt table gives you millimeters squared, convert it to meters squared. G is the length of the bolt, and that's the length between the two surfaces of the bolt head and the nut. So that's the, the part of the bolt that's actually getting stretched. I don't care if you've got a 400 millimeter bolt, but if that nut cinched down to two, you know, 20 mils, that's the length of the bolt I'm interested in. So the actual length from
Basically, you just solve this equation when it equals zero. And so the zero intercept of that equation gives you that intercept, which is fc at s equals zero equals that stuff. And then if I were to rearrange that, I could get f e at s, so the external load that occurs at separation, s, is equal to f i times k b plus k c on k c. So with these problems, and I'll work through one in a minute, first thing we do is write down all the stuff we know. So do I know the bolt length? Do I know the bolt area? Do I know the bolt material? Do I know the plates? Do I know the blah, blah, blah? And we calculate the KB, KC if we know them. The very next thing we do, oh, maybe we calculate that by. And then the very next thing we do is we calculate that FE at S. Is it going to separate? Are we past that? Or what is the threshold that that separates at? Because that then tells you, all right, now I know if I get an FE of whatever, then if it's less than this, I use this equation. If it's more than this, I use this equation. Okay? And I'll go through that procedure in the example that I have for the, the second half of this class. Okay? Um, but that's about as complicated as it gets. Because once you get FB, use it exactly the same as you did before. Um, and now, once you have compression in the plates and you can prove that you're staying to the left of that for all circumstances, that's when you can make that assumption that the plates carry all the shear. And now you only need to calculate an axial load. Yeah, so FB divided by AB and you're done. That's your stress. Um, unless it's fluctuating, at which point you've got to do all that A diagram stuff. Um, but this, this point, gasket failure, and it's also your assumption for separation. Uh, and if you find that you're working somewhere in the range between here and here, obviously you're separating and no longer can you make that assumption that uh, the plates are carrying all the shear, because at some point you're going to drop all the shear on the bolt. And that might even be more critical than just you know carrying all of that shear right from the very beginning. All right. values um, because it's easier and because it's just a little example and then you need to calculate a couple of things. So I'm going to give you KB and KC. You'll all ordinarily have to calculate these but I'm giving them to you, right? Now, just look at those scales or the magnitude of those. I want you to start to get used to seeing the right scale, the right magnitude. All right. Steel bolt somewhere in the you know 10 to 30 mil diameter range. You're going to be working in the hundreds by 10 to the six. So 400 by 10 to the six, 200 by 10 to the six, 600 by 10 to the six. In that range, if you get something by 10 to the nine, by 10 to the 12, by 10 to the two and it's not in that range, that's an immediate flag for you to question. All right, you stuff something up, you screwed a unit up somewhere, you've used megapascals rather than gigapascals, something, okay? So expect to see effectively E8, so four to the eight, four to the, you know, times 10 to the eight, around that range, okay? If you're not seeing that, then you've done something wrong. Plates, almost always single digit, to the power of nine, plus or minus, up to, depending on whether you're dealing with gaskets or just the plate region, might be 10 to the 11 in some circumstances. Um, but that 10 to the nine, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11 range for the plates. Okay, so once again, if you're outside of that, that's an immediate flag to go back and redo your calculation and double check all your units and powers and things like that. All right. Fi, let's say we have 100 newtons initially, and we're going to do three things.
first thing you're going to do is find S. I've given you an equation for it. Well, that's Fe at S. Second thing, if Fe equals 50 newtons, what is Fb and Fc? So calculate the values of Fb and Fc when Fe equals 50 newtons. If Fe equals 200 newtons, what is Fb and Fc? Alright. Really simple, busy work, but it'll start to get you comfortable using the different equations. Okay? So have a go at that. Okay, hey. So we want to find Fe at S. We've got an equation for that, which is Fi times AB plus KC all on KC. Whatever it gets. 120 newtons. Yeah, not in catch. Everyone got that? Great. Right. 120 newtons. Cool. So what that means is that on the graph, this is 120 newtons. Anything that way of 120 newtons, we use these equations for. Anything this way of 120 newtons, or between 0 and 120 at least, we use these two equations. Right? So every time you now know uh, an Fe value, you need to put it against those two criteria and work out where you are. Leads me to B. So Fe equals 50 newtons. Are we to the left or the right of the separation point? Left. Left. Beautiful. So that means Fb equals Fi plus Kb on Kb plus Kc Fe. And what we get for that? One oh eight point three newtons. Hundred eight point three. Can we get that? Great, easy. All right, and FC equals FI minus KC on KB plus KC FE, and that equals what? Fifty eight point three newtons. Cool. All right. As with all of the graphs that I make you guys draw, we now have checks and balances that we can apply on top of what we were just talking about. There we go. Alright, separation we just calculated as what value? 120 newtons, which means this point, FB equals FB, is 120 newtons. Yeah? So this value here is 120 because that's 45 degrees, so 120, 120. Alright, we've just gone that way. And we've gone that way by 120, so at least half, a bit over half, right? So a bit over half, we're halfway between Fi, what was our Fi value? 100 newtons. So we've gone halfway between what is 120 and 100 and got a value. What value did we get? 108. Is 108 between 100 and 120? Yes. And is it about roughly halfway, just to the left of halfway between those two points? Yes. We didn't stuff it up. Well done. All right. This point. Woo. All right. So 100 and 0. Halfway between 100 and 0 is what? 50. And are we to the left of that with our value? Yes, we are. All right, so it's not just a matter of using these equations as a black box. Every single thing we do, we can double check against some sort of a graph figure, something. All right? And as soon as you double check those two figures, then you've just not carried something through an entire AM diagram calculation and stress calculation and fatigue and all the rest of it. You've got a heap of marks lost um, because you've made sure that it's right. Okay? So put that in your workload, just double check, it doesn't make sense, is it between max and min in 
in that range, you know, roughly. Cool. All right. Now I'll rub it out so that these guys can see.
First example, gasket, gasket's easy. You just take the actual area of the gasket. All right? So um, if you have a whole gasket and 20 bolts, you calculate the total area of the gasket and divide by 20, and that's, that's what you use. Because we want that whole area of the gasket to be compressed. All right? And so we use the entire area. That's a simple black box equation for a gasket where you know the internal and the width and the number of bolts, but you can just as easily calculate the area of the outside of the gasket minus the area of the inside of the gasket divided by the bolt number. And in this case, we subtract the actual area of the hole cut out of it as well. So in some circumstances, a gasket will have a hole shot straight through it where the bolt goes. In some circumstances, the gasket will be inside and away from a bolt hole and just, you know, just a whole gasket. So what you're doing is calculating how much area of gasket is supposed to be held per bolt. Right? So most of what we do would just be simple, you know, circular donut shape um, gaskets. Some of them might have holes through the middle of them, some of them might have holes outside of them. You just need to calculate whatever that area is and you're on your merry way. Cool. Um, and because this gasket is squashed down here, Theoretically, we just use that same area all the way through. So the area of the plate above and below a gasket, you use the same area for the thickness calculation. Um, because we don't really have a particularly good way of doing it elsewhere. Um, theoretically, the, the compression will be distributed on some angle up to that bolt head there and down there. But that calculation, when you have a gasket, is quite complicated. Um, and it's actually more conservative just to use the whole gasket area, which makes it a bit stiffer, um, and so you need to put more tension in the bolt and so forth. Um, so that's just what we use. So whatever area the gasket is, you use for all three K values, and then one on one on one on one on, and then you're done. Cool. So if you have a gasket, it's really easy. Uh, this comes direct from your textbook. If you do not have a gasket, then you need to calculate an equivalent area of compression and that's where we actually have to deal with this situation whereby the amount of material that the head of the bolt actually compresses tends to expand out to some maximum and then contract back down to where the, the actual uh, nut is holding. Okay? And so theoretically this is the region of compression in those plates and we definitely do not want to analyze some sort of weird conical expanding and contracting shape. And so what we actually do is we take this measurement and this measurement and we average it. Alright, so we just take a nice average line straight down the middle of that and straight down the middle of that and say that's our area for everything. Alright, it's just a conservative way. It's been shown to be um, effectively accurate for, for the purposes that you're going to apply. It's a little bit conservative in some circumstances, but that's fine. Um, and again, you calculate this based on the whole clamping plate. So if you've got four bits of material there, you use the whole height and you work out the, the whole configuration for the entire length of that bolt and you use that area for everything. Right? So you don't use, you don't calculate little triangle things for each plate, but that's not actually physically how it works. What we're actually doing is calculating an area that really is dictated to by the diameter of the bolt and the total length of the bolt. Those, those are really the only two factors. As this expands out and comes back, and we just take the average. And so instead of making you guys do all the complicated triangles and trig and things like that, you're giving it, this is the derivation that the textbook does, and this is the result, right? Um, now D, I believe, is the diameter of the bolt or diameter of the hole, theoretically. Um, and G is the length of the bolt. Cool. So this equation, feel free to use it like a black box, don't get it wrong, um, understand where it comes from. It's just an equation that's calculating an equivalent here, an equivalent here, an equivalent here, and then averaging that whole area. So sort of the way that that's calculated. Okay. So D squared plus 0.68 D, G, G being the length, uh, plus 0 0.0, don't forget that, 0, 0.65 length squared, so G squared. 
right? And that'll give you the area, and you use that area for how many plates um, you have, two, three, etc. Okay. <coughs> So those are our two options, um, I think, uh, yeah, I'm onto my example. Um, so those are your two options, really, for calculating area. You might come across a circumstance where you need to do something more complicated. I uh, haven't seen one. Um, and as far as this subject is concerned, certainly, um, then those two other two that we're going to deal with. You've got a gasket, do a gasket thing, you've got that, um, just plates, do that. Now, uh, what defines a gasket? Basically, so a gasket is anything that's, let's say, significantly softer than the material around it. Generally speaking, a gasket will be pinched between two other harder materials. Um, so you might have a gasket on the outside or something. Um, that I can pick off anyways. Um, so a gasket is generally something that's softer than this type of material, and because it's softer, then that forces that localization of the compression to be in that zone. And so that's why we can calculate that. Um, if you've got two plates, uh, so for example, if I had stainless steel between two steel plates, I wouldn't really call that a gasket because that's sort of 190 gig compared to 207 gig. You, uh, yeah, maybe, but almost, almost certainly not. You just call them. I would, I would use this for my calculation. But if I had copper, which is 121 gig, I think, um, and steel plates at 207, then that's definitely gasket so anywhere probably more than about sort of 20 30 gig difference in the young modulus uh, would be a gasket and some gaskets will be vastly more so if you're using a cork gasket or rubber gasket or something like that that's going to be significantly softer than the actual material you're swashing um, and that's also important because when you actually squash it down you get almost no compression in a steel plate if you've got a rubber gasket there because the rubber is going to take all of that compression. Um, and that calculation for the stiffness takes that into account. So your stiffness will be really, really close to what the rubber stiffness is um, and only perturbed slightly by the fact that there's steel there because of the differential in those young modules. You guys can look into that. So try a couple of different things. Put some rubber there, put some copper there and see what the individual stiffnesses are and what the what the combined stiffnesses are and start to get a bit of a feeling. It'll help your engineering judgment if you have a bit of a feeling for what different materials will do as that gasket. Um, and, you know, it's a good thing to say. All right, any questions on that? No? Cool. Let's do an example, a proper example. Oh, I'll get this giant big board out of the way.
So these worded questions start to contain a lot of information. Uh, the first is that we have SAE class 5.8 volts, their M10 by 1.5, so we know their area, we know their material property. It says that the plates are manufactured from steel. That's important to us because remember now we have to calculate the plate stiffness, the Young's modulus. So plates are manufactured from steel. They're of equal thickness, which means I'm probably not going to draw it in the actual diagram. Uh, and the bolts are initially tightened to 90% of proof load. All right, now we've got proof load because we know the type of material of the bolt. Uh, and so that's quite a bit of information. We're going to do a few things. So we're going to do three things. First thing is we're going to calculate the separation point. We always calculate the separation point. If you're not asked to calculate the separation point, you still calculate the separation point. All right. So it's just what we do. We always do the bolts. If there's pretension, we do it. Second thing, <coughs> we're going to draw the plot of forces against FB. So we're going to draw that bolt diagram. And what I want you to do is actually draw the values on it. So I don't just draw a random bolt diagram that's meaningless. I want you to tell me what values each point is. Uh, and the third thing, determine tensile bolt stress when Fe equals FES on 2. So what that's saying is when the externally applied load is half the load it would take to separate the plates, that's when we're going to calculate the bolt stress. Now, with bolts, we now have two factors of safety when there's pretension and when we care about those plates staying together. All right? First factor of safety is against separation. And so in that context, this is a factor of safety of two. Okay. So the load is half what would separate the plates we classify plate separation as failure, a factor of safety of 2 is half the force that causes that. Okay? So this is a factor of safety of 2 against plate separation, also called gasket failure, or any number of other things like that. Okay? The second factor of safety is going to be the factor of safety against our, our actual bolt failure. And in most circumstances, bolt failure, uh, so plate separation will happen long before bolt failure will. So this tends to be more important, um, especially for steel application for gas and things. Okay. All right, so this is a really simple bolt application. We have two plates that are the same thickness, and we have. And 
by some mechanism and you're not told, you just assume that it's nice and evenly distributed. An external force is applied to the plates. Alright, so you might have you know, that plate with the bolt might have some sort of a you know hook mechanism that stretches the plates apart or something like that. Now what else do we need to know? Uh, the last bit of information is that that length of the bolt is 30 millimeters. Cool. Alright, let's put some assumptions down. <coughs> right, first thing is AC, so that's the area of the compressed plates. It's an approximation. It's worthwhile putting the assumption down that we are going to use the geometric method to calculate that area, which is that last equation that I showed you on the last slide. So that the average between the widest and narrowest part of that compression. If we had a gasket, it would be just as appropriate to say AC is calculated for all sections or all parts of the bolted configuration based on the area of the gasket per bolt. Because once again, in the gasket region, that's correct. Around the plates, that is an approximation. And so it's worthwhile just writing it down um, because if someone comes across a circumstance where that turns out to be garbage, they can do a better job of it. Um, and a better job of it might be done by using finite elements because what we don't want to do is hand calculation those weird sort of stress or force distribution from the inside of that plate. It gets very complicated. That's what final elements are for. Alright, this is one that's really common with these type of bolt ones. Low clearance. Alright, so this first assumption, the method that we're using to calculate that AC, requires that there is very low clearance between the bolt and the hole. Um, so if you've got a 10 mil bolt, effectively you want a 10 mil hole plus or minus what it takes to jam the thing in there. Um, what you don't want is a 14 mil hole and a 10 mil bolt bouncing around on the inside there because that kind of invalidates everything. Alright, so localised compression at the bolt head, so that's whatever, so these plates are actually sort of pulling on that bolt head, so there'll actually be some sort of a stress concentration type extra compression there. Um, we're not analysing that, what we're actually interested in is the compression of the plates down is in, down in this zone anyway, um, and so we'll just say that we're, we're not worrying about that actual compression in our, in our analysis. Cool. Uh, and then I'm sure there's a whole list of other assumptions you guys can make if you want. Um, weight doesn't really seem like it's going to be a, an issue in this example, but material being elastic and homogeneous is always a good one, and there's some very similar ones too. I don't want to write them down because you guys know how to do that. Alright, analysis. What did I say is the first thing we do for an analysis? What was that? Separation. Separation? Yeah, what do we need to do before that? Sorry? Free body diagram? Yep. Um, theoretically, we've kind of got one. What we might actually do is if we were to say this guy and that guy, we take the FC and FB. Nope, we now have a free body diagram of that bolt. 
Um, we don't really need to, you know, in the circumstances like the applications you've been doing, you need to do a free body diagram of a plate or whatever to try and work out some of those bolt loads, but um, this example is really easy. With bolts, the first thing I'd like you to do is just write down everything you know. Uh, it gets really confusing. Like, so you've got, you know, LCs and LBs and KCs and EBs and, you know, all of these different parameters. Uh, and, and a question like this is worded especially. Just looking at it, you don't really know what you don't know yet. And so you write everything down and work out, all right, I know this, I know this, I know this. I don't know that. Perhaps that's what I need to calculate. I know this and so forth. Okay? So for this example, it's easy because, you know, we're just asked to, at some point, calculate the stress. So FE uh, at separation is unknown, and that stress is unknown. But in a lot of the circumstances, like the bolt won't be known. And so your area of the bolt and things like that will be a variable you have to carry through. So it, it makes sense to us to, in a really structured way, write down all the information we know right at the very beginning for a bolt problem, um, because then we can go you know, eyes open to the, the rest of the problem. So, give it info. Um, and any calculations that we need to make. So, let's start with the bolt. Area of a bolt. We're told what size it is, so we can read that off the table. 58.0 millimeters squared. The length of the bolt, what's our length? 30 mils. Young's modulus of the bolt. If we're uh, class 5.8, what sort of a material is class 5.8? Steel? Yeah, they're all steel. All those bolts are steel. In a very, very specialised application, you might get a stainless steel bolt, uh, but all of those classes that you have in your textbook are all steel bolts. Cool. Um, so steel, Young's modulus, if you were to read the textbook table, is 207 gigapascals. Remembering that a gigapascal is a 10 to a 9. Proof load, we read straight out of the table, is 380 megapascals for the class that we're talking about. Um, and diameter of the bolt, which might be important, is 10 mils. Because we have an M10 bolt. Cool. Alright, now, um, what I might do is just at the bottom here, we can calculate bolt stiffness already. And so let's do that. Do it down here just because by the time I get up there, there's no room for it. So you're going to need bolt for stiffness. Alright. KB equals AB, EB on LB equals, remembering that we've got to get all of this in the right unit, so we've got a big spectrum of gigapascals, megapascals, millimetres and so forth. So it pays to be really kind of careful to put them in the right units every single time. 5.8 E to the minus 5 times 207 E9 divided by 0.03 and that equals 402 E6 newtons per metre. Can you see that, man? So 402, uh, sorry, 400.2 by 10 to the 6 newtons per metre. Does that match up with the range that I told you before? Yep. Yeah, so we're uh, something 100 by 10 to the 6, which is about, about right. It would be a very, very stiff bolt if it was by 10 to the 7, so it would need to be either a very hard bolt, I think, or a very, very large bolt. Okay, so they're, they're mostly in the 10 to the 6 range, so the ones we deal with. So this is all bolt stuff, so 
Bolt what we're given, bolt stiffness that we can calculate, bolt initial tension that again we can calculate based on what the bolt is. Fi equals Ki AVSP. Ki you're told is 90% of free flow, so 0.9. 5.8 e to the minus 5 is our area and free flow is 380 e6. Putting the e to 6 on the megapascals was something I saw probably 5 or 6 times in those quizzes as well. Um, people not putting, basically putting the megapascal value in rather than the actual pascal value in and then working with meters and newtons and things like that and getting a completely wrong answer. So, whenever you're calculating something, unless every single value in the equation is a megapascal and you're working self-consistently in megapascals, you always put that 10 and 6 on. Even if you know that it's going to come out right either way, it's good practice to do it. Because at one time, if you're doing it on autopilot, chances are it'll be the time that it's going to bite you. Alright, so that comes out at 19.836 new. Alright, so 20 kN, initial tension, we actually, that 90% of proof load is a lot of tension on the bolt. You think of 90% of yield, yeah, that's a lot of load. Um, and so, that's, that's the counterintuitive thing about bolts, that you're loading them up so much that sort of the, the fundamental engineer in us says, that's bad, we don't want to load them up that much, that's got to be worse because as soon as you add a load, more load to it. It's going to be worse, um, and so that's that's the bit of counterintuition, I guess, that you've got to get over with that pretension, because the pretension then buys you all of this extra compression in the plates and the shear carrying capability and all of that other sort of stuff. Um, that that is uh, a huge advantage. All right, so that's our bolt details. Let's do some plate details. All right. <coughs> LC1 equals LC2, I could just as easily use G, but I don't like using G for length. Equals 0 0.015 meters, or I could just as easily put millimeters. I suppose that's not very consistent with me, but you know, whatever. EC1 equals EC2 equals in steel, so again, 207 gigapascals. AC1 equals AC2, and we have to use an equation for that. And our equation is diameter of the bolt squared plus 0.68 diameter of the bolt times the length of the bolt plus 0.065, sorry, I'm going to go a bit far in here, the bolt squared. And if I sub a bunch of stuff into that, I would get 362.5 millimeters squared. Look at that in comparison to the actual bolt area. Bolt area 58. Clamp zone around the bolt 362. Does it make sense to us? Should it be bigger for starters? Yeah, probably. Well, I mean, your outside area is bigger and you don't really scale linearly with diameter, so it's probably going to be quite a bit bigger. Um, it's in the ballpark, so it's sort of a factor of what? Five more ish, six more. So that's you know that's that's starting to make us feel like we haven't accidentally stuffed that up. Um, but because this is a black box, effectively, and you're putting L's and D's and having 0.065s and things in it, uh, it's always good to just look at it, take a step back, rationalise it. Is it at least ballpark? Is it the sort of number that I would expect out of this calculation? Okay. Two plates, 
And so we're going to calculate two K values and then the, the collective. So KC1 is equal to KC2 because all of our values are the same. So L's are the same, E's are the same, A's are the same. Um, and that equals A, C, E, C on L, C. It's all the same. 3.625 E to the minus 4 is the area. 207 gigapascals and 0.015 and that gets me 5.0025 e to the 9 and then kc is equal to 1 on 1 on kc1 plus 1 on kc2 is equal to kc1 on 2 Theoretically, by the time I rearrange all of this, because these two are equal to each other. So that equals 2.50125 e to the 9, and that's Newton's per meter. An interesting thing happens when all of the plates that you're clamping are the same material. When they're all the same material, you actually don't need to calculate the individual layer stiffnesses and then combine it into the total stiffness. All right? For this exact reason, that if that's equal and that's equal, that plus that, rearrange, gives you that divided by two. If we look at that length, that's the same as multiplying effectively this bottom bit by two which is the total length. Yeah. So when you have all of those plates the same material, you can treat it as one single section. Total length, total area, total Young's modulus. And you'll get exactly the same number as that. Spend two minutes proving that to yourself. So calculate a single plate that's 30 mils long with uh, this Young's modulus and this area. Calculate K. Go. D is the diameter of the bolt and L is the length of the bolt. So D is 10 and L is uh, 30. Yeah. yeah, sorry guys, did everyone catch that? So D is the diameter of the bolt and the diameter of the bolt for an M10 bolt is 10 and L is the length of the bolt which is 30 mils in this, in this problem. A single steel plate that is 30 mils deep and has a 10 mil bolt through it. What is the single material stiffness? 2.5? Yeah. So everyone got that number, just treating it as one material. Cool. So when you use that in a quiz or an exam situation, Please give me a sentence that shows that you actually understand what you're doing and that you're not just blindly doing something silly. So, all materials are the same, therefore treat as single plate or something like that. Okay? A section that says that buys you the ability to avoid this calculation. Or, feel free to do this calculation. Now that completely goes out the window as soon as you have a gasket in the middle of it or different materials or anything like that. At that point, you absolutely must do this, okay? But if you have two plates that are the same, you can treat them as a single plate because uh, that's exactly how they work, okay?
Okay. It doesn't matter that there's a, a, a gap in there, then the science material like I simply pack the sign because they're in compression. Go, cool. alright. Um, there you guys can have a go. So the first thing we said we needed to find is S. So the separation point or F E S. Alright? You should now have all of the values that you need to do that. Please calculate that. And then B was draw the bolt diagram. Uh, and then C was use the bolt equation at a particular F E value. Alright? So spend the next 15 minutes um, having a crack at that. And then we'll be good. Alright, smash it. Looks like most of you got a selection of all of those. At least all match. Hey, F, E, and S, what did we get? Twenty-three thousand and nine. I got twenty-three thousand and ten point oh eight, which is as close to that. Like. Everyone good with that? 23 kilonewtons, effectively. Yeah? Cool. So again, um, think rationally about between FI and that. It's more than FI. It has to be more than FI. If it's not more than FI, you've got a problem. Um, B, let's draw it. Now, yeah, I'll draw it small so that you guys can see. Hopefully. Alright, our axes are force, and I'm just going to say in kilonewtons, and this one's Fe in kilonewtons. Right, the first point we have is Fi. Fi equals 19.8 kilonewtons. We calculated that. We know Fe at S is equal to 23.01 kilonewtons thereabouts, which means this point here point here, meet up at 23.01. And so that, if we didn't have any compression or inertia tension, would be the line. And this line joins to that, and this line joins to that, and then that goes horizontal zero. Have I missed any points? That's all the points we care about. Cool. Next question, C. Uh, what was it asking? It was asking for tensile bolt stress when Fe equals FES divided by 2. So already we know that that's going to be halfway along here and we know that that needs to be effectively the average between 23 and 19.8. So I want you to use the bolt equation but we can get a second number that should be exactly the same by taking 23 and adding 19.8 and dividing by 2, which should be something in the 21 and a half range thereabouts. Okay. But when you all, uh, in terms of force, uh, when you all used the Bolt equation, what did you get for FB? something or other, 23.04, I think I wrote down which is pretty much where we'd expect it to be along that line looking at the graph. And so once you guys did your stress calculation, what bolt stress did you get? 2.14 megapascals. Say again? 2.14 megapascals. 2.14 megapascals. That's what I think. That's a very, very small amount of stress on a bolt considering we already have taken it up to 90% of free load, which is 300 odd megapascal. That sounds more like the money. 369.36 megapascals. And that's it. Now, what was our proof load on this particular bolt? You wrote it down somewhere. Three, 380 megapascals. So the stress on this bolt at FI, if we didn't apply anything, is 90% of that, which is whatever that was, 310 or something. Yeah? So whatever stress you calculate forever has to be more than that stress, but not 
grossly more than that stress. So that already tells you that your bolt is working within a very finite window of 90% of proof load to something more than that. Okay? So when you calculate a stress, you want to make sure that, that, again, you can have that checks and balances and make sure your answer is right. So engineering is all about like having multiple ways to get to a solution and thinking rationally about every number that you calculate. And if you can do that, you'll be a terrific engineer. Cool. Alright, that's all I got for you today.